Well, hello and welcome to the December 3rd, 2023 online sermon from Christian Fellowship Church. Christian Fellowship Church is located in Northwest Indiana, specifically Hammond, Indiana. And our contact information is at the end of this video. We call ourselves Hammond's Bible Church because all that we try to do is, is driven by the Word of God. And I hope you'll see that in this video as we'll be studying the book of Esther again, Esther chapter 6. As we come to December 3rd, it is incredible that this is the last month of 2023. It is a great day as well, December 3rd. It's my wonderful wife's birthday. And it's been a very interesting date in our church. At one point, I think we had three or four people who all had this exact same birthday. And I think we still have a couple um, that are new to the church that have also got this day as their birthday. But December is... Uh, reminder to all of us when you start talking about December is the fact that it is the Christmas season and as we go into the idea of having our children's Christmas program our, our, our service on Christmas Eve and then with all the trappings that come with the holiday let us keep the focus on Jesus it's a trite saying but one that's so accurate Jesus is the reason for the season and I hope that you, who are believers in Jesus Christ, are aggressive in talking to people about Jesus. Let's not keep our focus off of him. We're going to transition into our music ministry and come back and have your Bibles open to the book of Esther, chapter 6.
the invisible hand of God. The idea that God is involved in our lives without being seen. We've been looking at this subject matter over our previous studies because it is a key part of the book that we've been studying. And if you've been part of these videos and you haven't realized it by now, God is clearly, clearly involved in the lives of believers and unbelievers as well. And we'll see that even in our text today. We know God is taking events and controlling them. He is especially watching us as believers, as we believe Psalm 91, Hebrews 13, Romans 8 all teach. As we've been studying one of the greatest stories in the Bible, we've been giving God the credit, even though he's not mentioned once by name in the book of Esther. Now, we've also been looking at some other stories as trying to Ill use as, <coughs> excuse me, illustrations to see how in life, in history, God has had his hand on people. And this, for this message, I not only have one more story, I've got five, five incidences that I could have picked out of thousands regarding God's hand. Some of these are, uh, are well, let me just go through them, and I hope that you find them interesting. The, I'll preface the first one. It's more of like a kind of cute one. Matthew 19 says, What God brings us together, let no man tear asunder. On Sunday, when I present this message, I'm going to show a photo of a couple that have been married for about 11, 12 years when this photo is taken, and it's in the uh, Zhengdu uh, area of China, that there's a Mr. Yi and a Mrs. Zhu who had been married at that time for about 11 years, and they're standing in front of a large red art object. What's so interesting about this is, as I said, what God brings together is that through a series of coincidences that they look and say, God had his hand on us to bring us to get married. And this is, you know, this is a photo that made a big impression in China, and that's part of the reason I'm, I am sharing it. It's that this couple, they get married, and after they're married a couple years, the husband is going through some of the wife's old photos before they got married. And he's looking at this photo of her in front of this art object. And it's just like a giant spiral red. There's nothing, you know, other than it's large and big. But she's standing in front of it. And as he's looking at the photo, he sees, you know, there's crowds, a few people behind her. <laughs> the one person who's posing right when she's taking her photo, it's him. And one of the reasons I brought this up is because he's got a pose that he stands whenever he takes a picture. And there's a little irony in this for me because I don't know if you're familiar with me and you know me. Whenever uh, I take a photo, I started this maybe like 20 years ago. A lot of times when we're on vacation, sightseeing, and they'll say, take a photo, Mike, and I'll go, I'll put my arms out. Well, this guy's got his pose and he goes, oh my goodness, that person in the distance, that's me, that's my pose. And they get it blown up and sure enough, it's him. He goes home, digs out uh, to his parents' home or something, digs out some old photos and sure enough, he's got the photo from the other angle. And people in China were just blown away thinking somebody had their hand on bringing these two together. That when they saw this photo and it put it all together, they would say, not a coincidence, God had his hand on bringing us together. So just a small story. But the second one I have is the fact that there's a photo that I'm going to show of a man who is very famous, but you may not know the background. When he was a student in 1916 in Britain, he was on a uh, railroad station that he had to traverse every day. And as he got on to the railroad, the, the train, there would be a bookstore because a great place to put a bookstore because people know they're going to be on a train maybe for a half hour, hour, and they might pick up a book and read. And the key in this is that this man continually comes and looks at books, and there's one book called Fantasies. I got to say the name right, and not spelled with an F. It's F-P-H-A-N-T-A-S-T-E-S. And it's by George MacDonald. And the man keeps looking at this book, and he keeps putting it down. And one day he just picks it up. And he says, you know, today 
I'm going to buy it. He doesn't know anything about it. I don't know why. But he randomly picks it up after weeks or months of seeing this book, and it leads him to get saved. Who is this man? C.S. Lewis. Random coincidence that the information in this book would change his heart, change his attitude, be used by God? Just a coincidence? I don't think so. Another one is, I'm going to show a photo from the 6th century. Not a photo. Yeah, well, it's a photo of a, of a drawing that's on a, a, a wall. Um, I believe in, it's in the Vatican now. But it is a picture of the well-known theologian Augustine, or Augustine as some people say. I like to say Augustine, but some people I know say Augustine of the 4th century, Augustine of the Bishop of Hippo. You may not know his story. Here he is somebody who's been given the scriptures, but he's not a believer. And as he's sitting out one day, and like might be by his house or on the road, some boy comes by and just says to him, read it, read it. This is a famous story. Read it, read it. And he's like, what are you talking about? And he looks down and he sees this Bible, uh, the scroll that he has, and he says, read it. And he picks it up and randomly goes to Romans 13. We know now it's Romans 13. It wasn't Romans 13 then. But he reads it and it leads him to getting saved. And one of church history's best known theologians, whether you love him or you hate him, but he's one of the best known, gets saved because some kid just randomly, out of nowhere, just says, read it, read it. And Augustine hears it and reads it. Fourth coincidence, a good friend of mine in Columbus, that when Becky and I was part of the uh, college and career group back in Columbus when we first got saved, we were given testimonies, and I'm just going to call his name Bob. Bob says, you can't believe how I got saved. He goes, I grew up in a non-Christian home, pagan, and I love music, and I love like um, pop music, rock and roll music, and he would go into a record store, vinyl records, if you, some of you can remember those. And this was always very popular on campuses. And when he uh, goes into the he goes into the bookstore, uh, I mean into the record store, he ends up just like looking through like heavy metal, you know, classical music. You know, he's going through the different pop music, and he comes across this one album, and it looks intriguing to him. And the, what's intriguing to him is the fact that there's something on the cover that pulls him in, and he buys it, and it's a Christian album. And I can't remember if it's Sandy Patty or Michael W. Smith, those were popular artists even in the 80s. And when he takes it home, he you know, might pay 50 cents for it, so the very fact that it was 50 cents is amazing. He buys this album, takes it home, starts leading, liking the music, but more importantly, more importantly, in the album is a track that's written like into the cover, and he reads it, and he gets saved. Random coincidence to go into a random record store to get a record, or a record that just is perfect to lead you to the Lord, has the right thing set on it, changes not only history, um, for an individual on this side of eternity, but for all of eternity. Random? And that's why I want you to start thinking about how life's events could impact you and how you see God's hand on all of this. Well, for me, the fifth story was one that I just thought, small event happened this week, um, but I think you might find it interesting because, again, when I talk about God's hand, I think this happens every day, personally. But here's one that I think you might find humorous. It happened this week. We have our men's study on Tuesday, and when we have the study, <laughs> Carl's been overseas. He doesn't know the last time that we've met. We're, we've used my TV for a slideshow presentation, and now he comes, and he wants to do a slideshow presentation. And so when Ken goes to move the box, to get the uh, computer plugged into it, for some reason, my box breaks. And so we try to fiddle with it for 20 minutes, but then we just work around it, have the presentation, all the guys leave, and I know Ken felt really bad, and Ken, don't feel bad, watch where this story goes. All right, that's my saying to Ken, if he ever watches this video. Like, hey, watch where this goes. Well, because of the fact that my box 
is broke, I spend the next two hours thinking, maybe I've got cables wrong, check all my cables, try to reboot it, it's frustrating. Finally, after two hours, around 10 o'clock, I call Comcast Xfinity up, and I get a lady in the Philippines, and she's gracious, she asks me where I count a number, so I gotta look that up, and she uh, goes, starts going through testing procedures, and she's concerned, looks like my box is broke, and then she starts revealing my account. Well, here's where it gets more than coincidence. If I don't call because my box breaks when Ken moves it, I don't find out that I'm going to be fined that month $30. $30 is important to me. She tells me that our, we've had a data overage and the fact that because of our data overages, which is due to our getting new phones that month, all four of us, I'm going to have to pay at least $30, maybe $50 for this fine. And I tell her, look, this has never happened to me. You know, look at all the years I've been with Xfinity. Can you waive it? And she, sure enough, takes time. She looks at it. And as she's looking at it, she comes back and she saves me 30 bucks. She waives my fee. I am just ecstatic. So 30, 50 bucks. Wow. Thankful. But on top of that, as I'm waiting, I, I, because she's asked for my account number, I've looked it up. And as I've looked at my account, I see that... I've been getting a $42 a month credit from Comcast for promotional discount. I don't know if you know that, but you've got to be aggressive. You've got to ask for these sometimes. And even if you were an existing customer, you can ask for a promotional discount. Well, guess what? My promotional discount of $42 a month is ending December 12th, I believe it is. And you've got to ask again for another one. They don't just give it to you because they don't want to give promotional discounts if they don't have to to existing customers but you can ask and because my box breaks I'm made aware that it's ending and I ask again I could have gone at several months when my bill gone up like well, and I would have paid um, extra this potentially could have saved me five hundred dollars so Ken my box gets moved my box gets break you think it's a coincidence I think it's one of these things that God does for believers small, but I think I give him credit for it. And you say, Mike, you know, how do you know? Well, the reality of it is, is I don't know, but I look at the fact that I know that God cares for me and God loves me and he's always watching over me. And I think that's critical for us as we come to the book of Esther. We're in the sixth chapter as we watch the story play out of this incredible hand of God. Remember, God's not mentioned once in this book about how God is going to bring about deliverance and protection for the people of Israel while they are refugees in the land of Persia, while they are under an execution order. The very, well, one of the very earliest Holocaust plans ever. Um, the Amalekites had a plan back at the Exodus, and now we're seeing that one of their descendants, Haman, also wants to carry out that. So if you haven't been with us, by the time we come to Esther chapter 6, we have seen Esther chapter 1 give us the historical reality that we're dealing with King Ahasuerus, who reigned from 485 B.C. to 465 B.C. And chapter 1 tells us about his drunken anger, let's get rid of the queen, uh, act in chapter 1. Chapter 2 is the beauty contest where... Esther is made queen, but it's not like a you know, Miss America contest. It's a perverse sexual contest. Chapter 3, we learn about Haman. Haman is our evil character. He's our Adolf Hitler. He's the one who devises a plan to get rid of the Jews. And he appeals to his gods. Even though he doesn't say gods, he just rolls the dice. He throws the lots. And the plan is set in motion for 11 months from the date that he rolls the dice. <coughs> and that occurs in about 474 BC when he rolls the dice. We've gone about nine years from chapter one to chapter three. Chapter four is the passage with great anguish where Esther learns about the plan. She's been keeping it secret that she's a Jew. And Haman's plan is to kill all the Jews. We estimate Again, between six, 12 and 16 million people, it is believed, would have been wiped out. They wouldn't have been allowed to, to fight back. And you've got to 
tell you uh, this week, Ken Fednick, Ken sent me a video on the Persian army. And let me tell you, it is big, it's massive. Could they have killed 12 to 16 million? Absolutely, absolutely. They could have just wiped all these people out. So please, this is not an overestimation that they could have done this. And so Esther is challenged by her cousin Mordecai. Hey, you gotta go talk to the king. But she knows if the king wants to kill her for coming in unannounced, it's maybe normal procedure. And so she risks everything, goes in to see the king, and in chapter five, we saw favor given to her that she's allowed to have a banquet. And then when she's at the first banquet, she thinks the timing isn't right for whatever reason, and she asks for a second banquet. And that's where we are as we come to chapter six. And you have sermon notes, which I send out to our church. Fill in the blank, the incredible night between the banquets. And if you'd like these sermon notes, email our church if you're not a regular attender, and I will make sure these get sent to you. So let's just pick up. Haman has been to the first banquet. He's had a good time. He's been invited to the second banquet. And now we come to this situation. And I'm just going to tell the story. You know, play it out. It says in verse 1, During the night the king could not sleep. He couldn't sleep. So he gave an order to bring the, to the book of records, the chronicles, and they were read before the king. Now, listen, there's a lot of things he could have done at this time. He could have asked for a concubine. He doesn't ask for a concubine. He doesn't, you know, you know he wants to read. And, he, he, you know, I don't know if they got Sports Illustrated at this time, but think about it. He, he wants to read the official government books. Now, maybe he really thinks that will put him to sleep, but that's what he asked for. And so somebody starts reading it to him. Somebody was around that could read. I don't know if you catch that, too. Number two. It was found written that Mordecai had been reported concerning Big Thana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who were doorkeepers after they had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. Well, we learned about this in chapter 2, that Mordecai found out about this plot, reported it to the king, found out through the investigation it was true, and these guys were executed. So, think about this. You know, you got this big book, you got multiple books, you pick something up from something that happened maybe, get this, five years earlier. Again, you know, there's a speculation that was five years before this event. So you, you don't have just one book that you could have been pulled up. You got the one book that has Mordecai in it, and that gets picked up. And then the king says, what honor or dignity has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? Because my understanding is the Persians were big on honoring people. And so the very fact that he reads it. He's inquisitive. He hasn't fallen asleep yet. He says, um, what honor has been given to Mordecai? Then the servants who attended him said, nothing's been done for them. Now, I don't know if you caught that or not, but I think that's absolutely mind-blowing that they are able to quickly get back to him and say, nothing, because this is all happening in the middle of the night. And so, verse 4, so the king said, who's in the court? Now, the night has, must have rolled into the early morning because remember, Haman, after coming out of the first banquet, is all excited with his wife and friend's plan to have Mordecai killed that very morning. And so Haman obviously is all ramped up. He's excited. And the king says, well, who's in the court? And Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace in order to speak to the king about hanging Mordecai on the gallows, which he had prepared for him. Remember, the hanging isn't with the noose. It's hanging because he gets speared up the back with a sort of like almost like a lance kind of thing. And he rides in pain for several days and dies a slow, painful death on a 75-foot high construction site that Haman had built overnight overnight. Remember, Haman is the number two powerful man in the kingdom. He wants something done. It gets done overnight. Verse 5, and the king's servant said to him, behold, Haman stand in the court. And the king says, let him in. Let him in where? Let him into the bed chambers. Now, this is remarkable that the king even lets him come into the bed chambers. But, all right, the king wants to act on this quickly. So verse 6, so Haman came in and the king said to him, what is to be done for the man whom the king desires to honor? And Haman said to himself, Whom would the king desire to honor more than me? 
<laughs> oh my goodness. There's this uh, <laughs> quote from the old famous actor, John Barrymore. It's very similar to this. John Barrymore used to say, one of my biggest regrets about being on stage or being on film is that I don't, more about being on stage, it has to be, you know, obviously film would work. Being on stage is that I can't be in the audience to watch me, i.e. I'm so great. And so, <laughs> Haman comes in and when the king asked what is to be done for the man whom the king desires to honor, and Haman said, whom would the king desire to honor more than me? And we're, we're talking ego time, baby. And then Haman said to the king, for this man whom the king desires to honor, let him bring a royal robe which the king has worn, and the horse on which the king has ridden, and on whose head a royal crown has been placed. <laughs> let, basically, let him be paraded around as if he's the king. Now, this whole chapter at this point almost becomes comical. And yet, at the same time, i got to point out, unbelievers read this and they say, look, there, there's no way they would have put a seal of, um, the, um, on the horse. And just like unbelievers have said, the walls of Jericho really didn't fall and the walls of Jericho didn't burn. And you go there and you find, my goodness, there's evidence all around. Guess what they found? They found a, an inscription or like a, stone carving or something like that where, with a Persian horse with the king's seal on it. So I just begin to laugh at the way this whole chapter reads and even how it plays out in history. So Haman says, Let him bring a royal robe, verse 8, which the king has worn in the, on the horse which the king has ridden and on, his hood, on whose head a royal crown has been placed. And let the robe and the horse be handed over to the king's most noble princess and let them array the man whom the king desires to honor and lead him on horseback through the city square and proclaim for him, thus it shall be done to the man whom the king desires to honor. And then the king said to Haman, take quickly the robes and the horse as you now have said and do so for Mordecai the Jew who is sitting at the king's gate. Do not fall short in anything that you have said. You say, wait a second, what in the world is going on here? What in the world? The king is like, wow, we've got to put this all out for this man. And so take quickly the robes and the horse. You see, take quickly, like get it done today. We've waited long enough. It's been about five years. So verse 11, so Haman took the robe and the horse and arrayed Mordecai and led him on horseback through the city square. And at this point, you got to be like mind blown. You got to be thinking, this is absolutely crazy, crazy in the sense that you have Mordecai being honored on the very morning, the very morning he was to be executed by Haman. And now Haman has to be humbled out the gazoo because he is leading Mordecai through the city, getting all the honors that he thought was coming to him. So verse 10, Then the king said to Haman, Take quickly the robes and the horse if you said, and do so for Mordecai the Jew, who is sitting at the king's gate, and do not fall short in anything that you have said. Do you see that line? Don't fall short. You can't stop anything here. So Haman took the robe and the horse and arrayed Mordecai and led him on horseback through the city square and proclaimed before him, Thus it shall be done to the man whom the king desires to honor. Oh my goodness. I mean, ironic laugh, ironic laugh, ironic laugh. I mean, there, if you had a movie or TV sitcom, you'd be putting ironic laugh in here, ironic laugh. Mordecai, can you imagine? We're talking like an all day thing, all day thing. Thus it shall be done to the man whom the king desires to honor. I mean, every sentence has to be like a stab in the heart. Verse 12, then Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman hurried home, mourning with his head covered. His head is covered. You can't miss this. We've gone from chapter 3 and 4 with the anguish and Mordecai being in, you know, ashes and sackcloth and the incredible anguish that all the Jews have had and Mordecai with... Uh, so much pain that he's experienced, but now Haman has got his head covered and he is in mourning. And 
verse 13, that Haman recounted to Zerus, his wife, and all his friends, everything that happened to him. Then his wife, then the wise men and Zerus, his wife, said to him, if Mordecai before whom you have begun to fall is of Jewish origin, you have not overcome it. You will not overcome him, but will surely fall before him. And you got to sit back there and out at almost, almost at the point of like, you're going to burst out laughing. Why? Well, because back in the previous chapter, his wife and everyone said, look, you got to kill Mordecai. Look at chapter 5, verse 14. Then Zerus, his wife, and all his friends of them have a gallows 50 cubit high and make... And, and in the morning, ask the king to have Mordecai hanged on it and go joyfully to the banquet. Now they're saying, oh, I told you. <laughs> he told you. He's a Jew. You can't win against the Jews. You can't beat the Jews. And, you, and, you're, and if you're, you're Haman, you're like, where were you yesterday? Well, what's wrong with you people? You know, what, you didn't tell me this yesterday? And I understand that the Persians really read omens, you know, because remember, Haman throws the lot too. There's that in, in that, the idea of the invisible God, and here you're seeing it right here. They're saying there's like there's an invisible God out there, people, and 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 that's what I don't want you to miss. Verse thirteen. There's the invisible God. They say there's there's like a force. Now the world might call it karma. We know it's not karma. We know it's not luck. We don't know. We know it's not coincidence. We know it's God's hand. And so while they were still talking with him. The king's eunuchs arrived and hastily brought Haman to the banquet, which Esther had prepared. Bing, ding, dinner time. And again, you're watching a movie and all these things play out. And you say, well, it's a movie. And it's like bang, 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 bang. The sequence can't be any more concise, any more constricted, any more put together. This is all made up. But it's not made up. As we've said over and over and over, the story of Esther is true. It's rooted in history. It's something that we need to recognize is true. And this is all part and parcel of God's hand being put on the situation. And right now, the tables have turned. You ever hear that expression, the tables have turned? Where did that come from? Well, it came from people who played board games a lot. And it came from the situation, like we're playing a board game, maybe we're playing chess or backgammon or some other game that's played on a board. And where maybe somebody was beating somebody horribly, they would have this always a practice and say, well, let's turn it around. You know, I've been beating you in chess. I'm white. You're black. Um, you are, um, the white is going to win. And so let's turn this around. And now let me see if, if we can turn the table. And all of a sudden I could recover. And so the idea if we're playing checkers, the red and the black, and I'm black and I'm winning, and you're red, and I'm gonna give you a chance. We'll turn the tables, we'll turn it around and see if you can come to victory. Well, the idea here is more so that everything that looked like Haman was about to have incredible victory. And we're not talking like days or weeks or months, we are talking hours away, that all of this sequence happens in a very short amount of time. It reminds us God's sovereignty, God's hand. You know, I've alluded to this passage several times in our previous studies, and I think for us today, New Testament saints, how important is it for us to read Romans chapter 8? I want you to read, and Sunday, December 3rd, is going to be Communion Sunday, and so what a good reminder for us as we come to Romans chapter 8 of how God is working things out. And Romans chapter 8, for those of you who study the book of Romans, you know that the Apostle Paul is working through our salvation. How we're sinners in chapters 1 and 2. How none of us can pay the penalty for our sins in chapter 3. Uh, is also included. None of us can be good enough in chapter 2. But it's going to be faith alone in chapter 4. The fact that we were enemies with God is in chapter 5. How Jesus Christ provides the provision for us through chapter 5, 6, 7. And as we come to chapter 8, the Apostle Paul writes... And we know that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love God. To those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, and so that they, he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. 
Verse 31, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over to us, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? Who is the one who justifies? Who is the one that condemns? Christ Jesus is he. Rather, who was raised and who was at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us? Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? For just it is written, we are being put to death all day long. We were considered a sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, we've overwhelmingly conquered through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Why? Because God is control. God is sovereign. God's hand is on us, the invisible hand. He was there to protect the Jews. There, there's no way the Jews will ever be wiped out. They'll be killed at times, but they're never going to be wiped out. There's going to be difficulties for the Jews throughout all history. And when we pray for Israel today, we want to pray not only that this, they win this battle against Hamas, but we also pray for Israel to get saved. That, that's a different side note. What I want us to I'm talk about, we're talking about no coincidences, just God. So I go through five stories about how God, I think, has his hand to bring a, an, an unbelieving couple together. I, I think, and give them confidence, because the articles went out on the, the, the Chinese couple about how they believe God's hand was on them, how God's hand was on C.S. Lewis to get him saved, to randomly pick a book up, how God's hand was on Augustine of Hippo, how God's hand was on my friend Bob, how God's hand was even on a simple thing of making sure I pay less this month to my Comcast bill. Look at where God has you. Look at trust God's hand. We're going to get more into the details of coincidences in next week's study. Come back to chapter 6. But for now, make sure that you're on God's team and you do that first and foremost with the gospel. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. It's as simple as ABC. A, admit you're a sinner. B, believe upon Jesus that he's God and man who died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sin. And C, call upon his name knowing whoever calls upon his name will not be disappointed. And then Read his word and live accordingly. We'll go into that in more detail, but the more you study God's word, it shows that you're trusting him, that he is working all things out, and you're going to follow his plan. When you do, when you do, you may not always see his hand, but you know it's upon you, and there's a confidence that we as believers have. God bless.